Well, good morning, everyone. Glad you're here this morning, and uh, man, it has just been a great week with Vacation Bible School and everything going on, and we're excited to see all of you here this morning. We're starting a new series this morning called Devoted to One Another, Devoted to One Another. We're going to be in this for three weeks, so let me just kind of give you just just a, um, a little foreshadowing of what's coming this fall. Um, on Starting August 23rd, we're going to do a, a sermon series. It is going to be a church-wide series, so even our, our uh, children's ministry is going to be doing it on Wednesday nights with us, um, but we're going to be doing a series called Life on Mission, and that will be our first series where we have um, small group material that goes with all the sermons. So what I'm preaching on the weekend is something that you'll have daily devos and these books that we're going to have you by. Um, And and then uh, there's also small group questions and material that you'll be going through with a a small group of believers from here at the church. And we'll be going through all of this together uh, for about six weeks beginning August 23rd, right right after school starts and all that. So we're really excited about that. I'm excited to get our small group ministry, our new connect groups um, off the ground and running. And there'll be a lot more information about that uh, coming up in the next few weeks. So just want to let you know about that for you uh, to also be praying about that and be concerned considering how you'll get plugged into that ministry. Uh, Some of you may have noticed the slap board out there on the wall, uh, just right out here across from that info center. Um, If you go out there, you can see where we'll be posting information about small groups for you to get connected. We're we're really, really excited about that. Now, if you want to kind of get to the crux of the why, why why such a move to small groups? Why are we pushing that? Um, Really, we've had small groups forever at Oakwood. Uh, Since I came here in 2003, we've had small groups in some way, shape, or form all the time, but we've never really made the push push to try to get everybody relationally connected, for, to get everybody into some type of relationships with other believers. And, and there's a reason for that. Um, you know, we want to see everybody advancing in their growth. We want to see you growing in your faith. And what we found is that when people practice the three C's, and if you're new to Oakwood, um, you may not have heard of that yet, but if you go to Discover Oakwood, you'll hear about it. Um, or maybe you're a church member, you've been here for a while, you know about once a year, we, we pull over to the side and we talk about the three C's of Oakwood. And what we find out is if people do the three C's and it's celebrate, connect, contribute, if people actually do those things, we actually see spiritual growth in their lives and we see a fire begin to ignite in them. And all that simply means celebrate is to come to church regularly, to be a part of this fellowship of believers where we come and and we celebrate baptisms and we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, We sing songs of praise together. Uh, We proclaim the word of God. We, We do these things together and we celebrate who God is and the work that he is doing amongst us. The connect piece is what we're going to be really focusing on this fall, and that is fellowship with one another, fellowship with one another, fellowship with believers. And uh, we have scriptures in the Bible like Proverbs talks about that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And so those are the type of relationships that the Bible tells us we're to have with other believers. And so we'll be making an emphasis on that and getting connected relationally. And then the third C is contribute. And we talk about contribute really in two ways, that we contribute a portion of our finances regularly to the Lord's work, but we also contribute um, in ministry and service. And so we contribute um, our, our talents and our time and our testimony. We contribute those things to God and see the kingdom advance. So we're really excited about those things. I hope that you are too. There'll be a lot more information, especially next week on August 9th, coming out about all that and how you can can actually get into one of those small groups. So uh, be paying attention to that. um, And we're really excited to bring that to you. You know, all this is really about great commission living. Someone asked me this week, you know, what is the mission of the church? The mission of the church, Jesus gave us Matthew 28, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So we're supposed to make disciples, we're supposed to baptize them, which is that point of conversion, and then we're supposed to teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded us. And so, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but that gets me really, really excited because it's like we have a mission here. We are disciples who are to make disciples. Now, what we've done as Americans a lot of times is we say, well, we hire that out. We we, we hired that out to the ministerial staff. That's why we pay them is because they make disciples. I sit in the pew and consume. And it's like, no, 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 no. That is not what God ever intended the church to be. He intended all of you to be missionaries. Now, can you imagine what this church would look like in a year if everybody took the mission seriously? 
If everybody got out and got connected together and started sharing with their neighbors and become outwardly focused, but here, here's the deal, okay? We cannot sh- start sharing the gospel or our lives with our neighbors. It's not possible to do that unless we are able to share our lives right here. And so that's what we're going to focus on this fall is sharing within the body of Christ and being in small groups and, and, and enjoying that fellowship together. Now, if you think, hey, man, this is some idea that, you know, somebody went to a conference or the elders were praying and they came up with this idea. This, this is not a human idea, okay? This is a scripture idea. Fifty-nine times in the New Testament, it gives the phrase that you are to do blank with one another, I like to call them the one another's of the New Testament. And there's 59 times the New Testament says to do things with one another. And here's some of the things that it talks about. It says to love one another. It says to serve one another, forgive one another, bear with one another, teach one another, pray with one another, submit to one another. And it even says to admonish or correct one another. And get this, half of the New Testament, if you were to break it down, half of the New Testament is written about relationships and how to do life with humans, how to do life with one another. The other half of the New Testament is about doing life with God. And so there's a whole half of the New Testament that we need to pay attention to. We're going to be getting into into that as we go today because we must confess that our God is a God of relationships. He is a relational God. He created Adam in the garden to have a relationship with him. And do you remember how the creation story goes, that God created the heavens and the earth and the light and then the the sea creatures and the animals and the galaxies? He created everything. And what did he always say? He created and he'd say, it is good. And God saw that it was good. 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 And all through the Genesis 1 account, you see that it's good, it's good, it's good. And then there's one point where it says, it is not good. Do you remember what that was? It says that he created Adam and it was good. He said, but Adam was lonely. He was, he was alone. And God said, that is not good. It is not good that Adam's alone. So I'm going to create for him a helpmate. And his helpmate's going to be Eve. And so there was this relationship between Adam and Eve. And then there was a relationship between Adam and Eve and God. But God is a relational God. We see that in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see it in the Bible that God has a relationship with his people. And we see it even today that God wants a relationship with each and every one of us. Now, all that being said, some of you are already uncomfortable. You're already uncomfortable because... You don't really have a deep-seated desire to be in a small group and to let other Christians into your life to know you. There's this fear of vulnerability that if they really get to know me, if somebody in Oakwood Christian Church really got to know me, if they really knew that I make mistakes, if they really knew that I sin, that I make bad choices, if they knew some of the stuff I did 12 years ago, I don't know that they'd accept me. I don't know that they let me fellowship with this body anymore. And there's this this unspoken fear that that we were actually scared to open up and to be with people. The fact is, though, that we're going to have to put ourselves out there and overcome that fear if we want to do life together. Because the fact is, if you're saying, you know what, I'm not really into that, that's just not my thing. So I'm just going to come on Sunday mornings. I'm going to, you know, amen a sermon a couple times a year. You know, I'm just going to do what I've been doing. I'm going to stay where I'm at. I'm at least saved. I may not be growing, but I'm at least saved. You know, you don't really have a problem with us. If you think, well, I'm going to have a problem with Eric or the leaders, you know, you really have a problem with God. And the reason for that is because God commands his people to be in relationship with one another. And he doesn't give any excuses. He doesn't say, well, you need to be in relationship. You need a fellowship with, with one another unless this or unless that. It just says that we're to do it. And so we want to be God's community. We want to be God's church. We want to be a part of his family so that we can build our lives together and share our faith with others. You know, it's really hard to practice the biblical one and others if you don't know anyone, if you don't share your life with anyone, if you're not in a relationship with anyone. And maybe we could be just real honest for just a minute here. Some of you know, right now already, you know this is exactly what you need to take your next step toward Christ. This has been the missing piece for you, is allowing yourself to be known in the body, making friends, building relationships, and doing life together, studying a passage of Scripture, talking about it with other Christians, having the accountability of a group that will look you in the eye and say, did you do what the Scripture said this week? 
I mean, I love James 1.22. It says, do not merely listen to the word. Don't merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And you're more likely to do what it says when you have to face a bunch of people the next week that say, did you do what it says? Or did you just merely listen to it again? You need the encouragement of understanding a passage together and getting it and praying for one another and encouraging one another to walk it out. And that's why we're in this series called Devoted to One Another. Devoted to One Another. Because we see this in the early church. We see this in the fellowship of believers. And we see all the wonderful, miraculous things that actually happen when they walk this out. Now, let me say this. If you're here today and you're not a Christ follower yet, you're not a Christian, then we invite you to listen in the next few weeks as we go through the Word of God together, as we talk about what it looks like for believers to do life together. But I want to be honest and say we don't in any way, shape, or form expect you to live like this because you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ. So we don't expect you to live up according to His teaching. But I do want to say this, that when you do become a Christian and you do call upon the name of Christ to be your Savior and your Lord, when He becomes your Master, when He becomes your King, then what we're about to learn about today and in the next couple weeks is expected of you as a believer of Jesus Christ. The fact is that most of you are at church because someone invited you. And most of you are at this particular church because someone specifically invited you. In fact, there may be some of you that are in this service right now this morning because someone specifically invited you to this service. Maybe they gave you an invite card or they just said, hey, meet me there at 1030. These people connections, these relational connections are a part of our faith walk with the Lord. And one of God's goals in the body of Christ in his church is that we wouldn't just attend church, but that we would actually attach to it. That it would become our way of life. That we wouldn't come on Sunday morning and be a bunch of fans and say, rah, rah, Jesus, and then just go out and do our own thing during the week. But that we come on Sunday morning as family, coming together and doing life together and sharing in each other's lives You see, he doesn't want people to just go to church. He wants people to be the church and to grow in the Lord together. I've been in ministry for 17 plus years full time. And I've learned myself that people don't grow the best in rows. They grow the best in circles. I give an example of that. When I was a youth minister and I was in Clinton, Oklahoma, I started a youth ministry called Chi Alpha. And Chi Alpha is Greek letters. It just means Christ first. And Christ First Ministries is one of the things is I had about 45 students coming on Wednesday nights to youth group. I I invited them to come and be a part of a small group. And I I got up in front of the whole group. I said, some of you want a deeper walk with Jesus. You just do. And and you've gone as deep as Wednesday nights will take you. And so I want to invite you to deeper. And what I did is Amy and I opened up our house on Sunday afternoons at four, and we invited 45 kids to come to our house. Now, of the 45 kids, only seven committed to coming. So it was truly a small group. But those seven students, we took them through a a curriculum called The Student God Uses by Henry Blackaby and just shared life and just poured into them. And they they were honest with us about their struggles and about their faith and, you know, even about their doubts and about their sins and their temptations and their family situations that, you know, were messed up. And we just did life together. And what encourages me is I can go on Facebook and look at some of these kids They were in that group from a long time ago, and I can see that they're still walking with the Lord today. And not only are they still in the faith, but a lot of them are leading ministries, they're leading Bible studies themselves. They're hosting a you know junior high small group at their house. Now I'm not saying one small group, you know, back when they were all seventh, eighth, ninth graders made just tremendous difference in their lives. But I know that there was a lot of walls that were broken down there together, and there was a lot of learning that was done, a lot of faith building being done. And it's because those seven decided, I want to go deeper. Just like the song Oceans that we just sang, I think it's time for us to go deeper. It's more than sitting in rows and amening a message, even if the message is awesome. It's about actually living it out in your life and having others come alongside of you and help you live it out in your life. That's the reason that we see in the book of Acts, the word together appears 24 times. And it's always about the church, the believers. They were together, 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 together. And most of us, deep down inside, we want this. And most of us, if we're really honest, we could say, 
we need this. I think it's just time to step out and do this. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And that's probably not going to be a new uh, passage to anyone if you've been around church life for any period of time. Acts 2.42 is coming on the heels of the Holy Spirit coming out on the apostles. Peter's just preached a sermon. People are stricken to the heart. And they just said, what are we, what, you know, we are wretched people. What do we need to do to be saved? And he just said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that we just received ourselves. And it says that the, the, the body started growing. The church started growing. And then you get to Acts 2.42, and it begins with the word They. And the they there is the church, it's the Christians, it's the believers. And this is what it says. It says that they devoted themselves to, and then it says four things, okay? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Okay, I want to talk about three of those, and I'm going to come back to one of those. The first one is the apostles' teaching. That would be the teaching of those who'd been with Jesus, who had seen Jesus, what Jesus had taught them. They were now writing down. They were also preaching and sharing with others. So they, it says they devoted themselves to that. They devoted themselves to that. And then they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. We see that as Holy Communion. And when the body of believers came together, they dedicated themselves. We are going to remember Christ's sacrifice so we're going to take this bread, or we're going to take this cup, and we're going to remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Because that's really, in essence, what it's really all about, isn't it? It's about Jesus. I mean, he's got to be the center of everything that we do. And then it says that they, uh, so the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, which we skipped, we'll come back to, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. When these people came together, they were going to pray together, and they were going to pray for what God wanted for their lives. And then they said, dedicate ourselves to that second one, to the fellowship. The word, the word devoted themselves to there in the Greek is the word proskartoreo. Pros and what it means is to actually attach oneself to, to be faithful to continually. The image I get is like a little kid when they hug their mom or dad's leg, and you kind of, you know, if you're a mom or dad, you know this, they kind of carry them around, you know, when they're two years old, and it's kind of fun. It's like a, you know, it's a ride for your kids, and, you know, you can still somewhat move around. And, but they attach themselves to, and they faithful and continually stay devoted to the fellowship. And that word fellowship, if you've been around church, you've heard it's called koinonia. It's a Greek word, koinonia. So they have proskartoreo koinonia, which means that they have attached themselves to deep fellowship. And this was really important to them. There's another passage I want to look at this morning. If you have your Bibles, if you're there in the book of Acts, turn over to the next book, the book of Romans. Turn the book of Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. And we're going to begin there with verse 9. Now, I don't know what your subheading says there, but mine says the marks of a true Christian. The marks of a true Christian. I'll be reading from the ESV this morning. Romans chapter 12 <clears throat> and verse 9. And this is what it says. Let love be genuine. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil and hold fast or cling to what is good. Verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Love one another with brotherly affection. That translation there of the words brotherly affection is a Greek word that says it's called philostorgos. Philostorgos. And what it means is a tender affection and devotion toward each other in family type of love. A tender affection and devotion toward one another in a family type of love. And so this is a devotion to each other, a brotherly affection for each other as family. And this is, this is the church in Rome that the Apostle Paul is writing to here. So after that, in, ver in, in the next part there, it says, outdo one another in showing honor. Verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in the Spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek and show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is peaceable with all. 
If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You see, this scripture talks about the fellowship of believers. And it talks about how we're to live. And it gives us a list there to live at peace with everyone. We're supposed to always be doing it in love. And we need to have a fervent spirit to help one another, to contribute to one another. And then all these things are to be wrapped in this idea of devotion through brotherly affection. Through brotherly affection. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to share with you in the next few minutes, why do we need to be devoted to one another? So we're going through this series the next three Sundays. Why do we need to be devoted to one another? What are some of the benefits of that? What's it going to bring about in my life if I decided I'm going to go from fringe, I'm going to go from attending to attaching? If I'm going to go from just attending to attaching, then what are some of the benefits it's going to bring in my life? And why do I need to do it? So why why do I need to be devoted to one another? Why do I need to practice that in my life? And the first thing is this, God commands it. God tells us to do it, to be devoted to one another. And when did obeying God become an option? I'm just saying. I, I know you, some of you think that it's an option. You know, it's, 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 it's an option. I hear Scripture all the time, and I have the option to obey what the Word says and actually do it, or to not do what it says, to disobey the Word of God. And that's just kind of... The way our culture is, it's like, well, you know, and some of us have selective obedience, don't we? Oh, we like that scripture. Yeah, and I already obey it because I believe it. So, yeah, that one I'm obeying. But that one over there about loving your enemies, no, that's not for me. You have not met my enemies. God did not know my enemies when that was written. So that can't apply to me today when he says love your enemies. You see, we have this selective way of obeying the scripture. But we see God repeatedly from the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament times, all the way to the New Testament, saying to us, do life together, fellowship with believers. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 says this, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, which means you're actually doing what the Word of God says, by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Now that you're obeying it, now that you've purified yourselves, you're obeying the truth, that you're to have this sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. God commands that we should just do it. The second reason, why do we need to be devoted to one another? We won't grow without it. I'm I'm just going to be honest with you. We won't grow without it. If you take an honest look back and you took a spiritual inventory of your life, And for some of you, you could go back 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 years. And you were to sit there and think back to a time in my life where I was on fire for God. Back to a time in my life where I was just, man, I was just kicking it. You know, we we were, me and God, we were close. I was excited to come to church. I was excited to, 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 to serve God. And, and, you know, this was a time of spiritual growth. And, and all this happened, you know, some phases in our life where we can think back. I want you to think back and, and ask yourself, were there other people involved in that? Because almost every time you think back, it was like, oh, I remember. I remember, it was that one year at VBS. It's the first year I ever volunteered. It was awesome. I got to know all these people. We were on fire. Had 350 kids come that year. I mean, it was amazing. It was, it was, it was awesome. If you really think back and you start looking at that, was there a Sunday school class that you were in? That you and all these believers were just getting fired up? Was there a small group that you were in? Were you serving on a ministry team with some other people? Did you do a service project? Most of you, if you think back, it may have had some elements of, oh, I was in the Word every day. I was reading the Bible. I was actually doing what it says. But when you actually start doing what it says, you found out that it always involves other people. It always involves other people. And so... To be honest, we won't grow without having fellowship and being devoted to one another. You see, true fellowship, that word koinonia, is about praying together. It's about serving together. It's about giving together. It's about growing spiritually together. It's about being there for one another when times are really good and when times are really bad. These are the fibers of true fellowship. It's like a coal in the fire. You got a bunch of hot coals in a fire, they all stay hot and they seem to keep burning. But you take one of those coals out and you set it to the side for about five, ten minutes, five or ten minutes, what happens? 
it eventually goes out. But you take that coal and you put it back into where all the other coals are in the fire and it heats back up, it turns that orangish red glow again and it starts providing heat again. It's the same way in the body of Christ. Those that seem to separate sometimes lose their heat, they lose their fire. You put them back within the fellowship of believers and you see it flame back up again and come back together. Let's just be honest and say we won't grow without fellowship. We won't grow without being devoted to one another. So God commands that we won't grow without it. Why else do we need to be devoted to one another? Let's be honest and say life is best when you share it with others. Life is best when you share it with others. It is fun. VBS this week was long. Some of you went to work every day, 8 to 5, and then you came up here from 6 till 8.30 or 9 every night, and it was long, but you kept coming and you kept serving, and you did it because you know you should, and you did it because it felt good, but you did it too because it was fun. There was a lot of adults having a really good time this week, even amongst the children. It was great to be on mission together. We have stories we could tell. Sometimes it's stories of naughty kids, but hey, there's some other stories too. There's some shared experience, you know. One of Dan Wilson's visions for VBS this year is he wanted to have a hospitality room. And, and when he passed away, we were like, man, well, who's going to do that? And so I know William Butler, Justin Loafman, Tracy, and a bunch of people stepped up and said, hey, we're going to do a hospitality room. What was great about the hospitality room was you'd go up there during VBS. I remember one night these two ladies were talking, and one of them started tearing up, and then they went over in the corner and they prayed for each other. That's like true koinonia fellowship. That's some deep fellowship going on there. We had people up there telling stories about things going on in their life, you know. And as they took that five, ten minute break from the kids they've been leading all night, they had these moments of fellowship, these moments of getting connected. That's what connect groups are all about. Shared experiences and they shared stories. You know, there was a high school in Montana that had a group of male students that decided to play a prank on the entire school. What they did is they went out and got three goats from one of their farms, and they painted numbers on the sides of the goats, and one goat got the number one, and one goat got the number two, and then another goat got the number four. And that was it. There was three goats, but they were numbered one, two, and four. And what they did is, after school started that morning, they released, they brought the three goats to school in the back of one of their pickups, and they released the goats into the school, and they started running everywhere. And it was great because, you know, the school's on like lockdown, and then they did a fire drill, and they got all the students out of the school while the staff and everybody was chasing the goats. But here's what happened. They chased the goats, and they can only find three. And they were numbered one, two, and four, so they knew number three was in the building somewhere, but they couldn't find number three. So they end up canceling school for the day. All the students go home, and they look for goat number three, which they never found because there never was one, and that was part of the joke on the school staff and administration is goats one, two, and four were the only goats that were released in the school. Now, now, here's the deal. That's kind of funny. It's kind of ornery, you know, may have broken some rules and stuff. But do you think those guys have stories, shared life experiences? I mean, you know those guys are telling those stories today. You know they're telling it to their grandkids. And I found out about it from being online. So you know that story, the legend of that goes on. And what, what's so fun about it is because they shared this experience together. This week at Vacation Bible School, it was a powerful week. And we shared experiences together. And we got to see kids worship. We got to see kids learn about true, truly how the world came about, about creation. We got to see them learn about the ark. We got to see them answer some questions that maybe we all have about dinosaurs. You know, were dinosaurs on the ark? And could they be on the ark? And, you know, last week we had Dr. Jackson here talking to us about that. I mean, I mean, it was great. But one of the funnest things and one of the intangibles about us doing a vacation Bible school is, yeah, we got to touch over 350 kids' lives this week. But I'm telling you what, the 120 adults and, and junior hires and high schoolers that were sponsors for that, that came to be a part of it, their lives got touched too. And even though we're exhausted, exhausted by Thursday night, 11 o'clock, we're still tearing down here. Even though we're all exhausted by it, it's awesome. Wouldn't trade it for the world. In fact, I'm just crazy enough to say, let's do two VBSs. Let's do two weeks of VBS. I mean, come on. It, it was awesome. It was great. And so let's just admit that, that, that God commands it. We won't grow without it. And life is best. We share it together. But there's a fourth reason here too. The early church members, the early fellowship of believers, they devoted themselves to fellowship. And you see the results in the New Testament. And I believe we are called, we must follow their example. 
We must follow their example. Romans chapter 1, verses 11 and 12 says, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. The Apostle Paul talking to the Christians in Rome. I, I want to give you something spiritual, spiritual gift to make you strong. And look what he says in verse 12. It says, that is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Folks, how does that happen? How does being mutually encouraged by each other's faith, faith happen if you're not connected? If you don't know anybody, if you don't have friends in the body of Christ? You see, the problem with our world today is that we think we're connected because of screens. We got screen relationships with people. We don't have to see them face to face. We just read their Facebook. That's all we have to do. Check their Twitter feed. Get on their Instagram. We see pictures of them, but that's not the same as a relationship. I think sometimes technology is a blessing, and sometimes it's a curse because it makes us think, oh, yeah, we're connected. No, you're not. You can't tell me anything about that person except all that they've bent on Facebook about. And then all you do is go, oh, yeah, I like that. Like, like. It's like, really? That's not a relationship. And here's the deal. Some people have this fear, this fear of being known or you know, fear that my past sins are going to come up in my group or whatever. But the fact is, is that being in these groups and being connected with one another keeps us on the path toward God. It helps keep us on the straight and narrow. It helps keep us holy and pure. When I started in ministry here in 2003 at Oakwood, I, was, I came here as children's minister and worked with kids for about four years. And during that time, Amy and I just desired fellowship with adults. We were with kids all the time. And so we started a small group. And we had a, had a group of believers that we became really good friends with. And then we went to the lake with these people. Um, the guys, the men from this small group, we played poker together. Um, we, did, we didn't gamble. We, it wasn't for money. We just played the game of poker. Texas Hold'em was popular back then. We played Texas Hold'em for you know, chips and pretzels. And you know, I mean, we just had a really, really good time together. We, we went to the lake. We did poker. We had cookouts, you know, kids playing together, play dates of the ladies, you know, having the kids have play dates together. I mean, we just did life together. And it was great. And then one of the key couples, it was the ones that had, we had fellowship at their house all the time, uh, they, they moved. Uh, uh, the, the dad got a job and they ended up moving to another, another town here in Oklahoma. And they moved away. And I was shocked when just three to four years later, I found out that they're getting a divorce. And I was like, what? They're getting a divorce? Law enforcement was involved? What? I know these people. I prayed with these people. I, I mean, we did life together and they are solid in the Lord. But you know what happened? They moved and they couldn't find a church. And they didn't find a fellowship of believers there. And so they got isolated and their coal got taken out of the fire and put over here. And guess what? Satan got in there and tempted them and just messed it all up. Because he's a liar. You said, ah, oh, you just sleep in on Sunday mornings. You don't need fellowship. You don't need a small group again. You don't need that. Yeah, I was just taking up too much of your time. Get out here and get isolated. Get isolated. We'll see how that works for you. It's just shocking. But let's be honest. We see that example from God's people in the Bible, and I think we need to follow it ourselves. I know some of you, another resistance thing, especially for the men, men don't want to be in connect groups. We don't want to be in small groups because we think it's like Bible thumpers meets Oprah's book club. You know, we think there's Kleenex, Kleenex involved every week, and people got to cry, and you know, and they're going to ask me to pray out loud in front of other people, and I don't do that. And I just want to assure you, you know, we're not, that's not, not the model we're using. Uh, we're training our small group leaders. Um, they're not going to ask you to pray unless you're comfortable to pray. But maybe that's your next step toward following Christ, is you'd be able to pray to God in front of other people, to share what's on your mind. But really, this all comes down to one question. One question I, I want you to be able to, to answer. And some of you, if you answer this honestly right now, you're going to say, no one. You're just going to answer it, no one. And for others of you, hopefully it'll be someone. But here's the question I want you to answer. Who are you pouring your life into? And who is pouring their life back into you? Who are you pouring your life into right now? Who do you have that relationship with where the iron is sharpening iron and there's mutual encouragement spiritually? 
Who are you pouring your life into? And who are you allowing yourself to be known enough to have them pour their life into you? If you're sitting here this morning, you're saying, not happening. Honestly, no one. There's no one pouring in. I'm not allowing myself to be known. Then I want to challenge you to get connected. To get connected with other Christians and to walk this life together. Because that's what we're created to do. That's what God commands. That's what God wants. You know, I've found that those who are out of fellowship with other believers many times are often struggling in another area of fellowship. And that's their fellowship with God. It just seems to be an indicator sometimes. If I'm out of fellowship with other Christians, I'm out of fellowship with God. Not all the time, but many times. Bob Russell in his book, When God Builds a Church, says this about the church. He said, the early church exploded in growth because people love being together. When you get a group of people together that genuinely believe in something, who really enjoy each other, who really love each other, it's so contagious that you can't keep people away from it. Many people assume that smaller churches must have better fellowship because at a smaller church, everybody can know each other. But churches that genuinely love one another don't stay small very long because that love is contagious. And true Christianity and contagious Christianity is birthed when people who are going to a Bible study and it's helping their marriage tell other people about it and invite them to come and they start learning about Jesus together and they start getting their kids together and they start hanging out together and doing coffee together and they go to the lake together and they have friends and they begin learning and growing together. And when there's a crisis in their life, those friends, they get through it together. Do you have other Christians right now in this church that are like brothers and sisters to you that you want to share your life with, that you can share your deepest things with? And they'll pray for you and encourage you. And we are called to be fully obedient to Christ. And I'm not sure if we can be fully obedient and fully go God's way if we don't connect. Would you pray with me?